Good morning, everybody. Uh, I spilled coffee at the last second. <clears throat> I jumped up to turn the thermostat up so the air conditioning would kick off, and I bumped the table and you know, coffee everywhere. Oh, okay. Good morning and welcome. What do we got on there? Um, three people. Wow, quite the uh, quite the mob drinking coffee out of my uh, mug that I fired back in. January, something like that. Here's Stream Wanderings. Wes is there and Ren Pixie, Mary, from Concho. Um, so today, uh, I, I got a lot of things I can show you. Um, I wanted to talk about the, uh, uh, the Museum Gates Expedition of 1901. So when I was looking at clay and, and um, ruins in the little Colorado River Valley back earlier this summer, uh, I really uh, was looking online for, for resources, and I came upon this book, this publication that was done in, in 1901 uh, from an archaeological expedition that was done up in that area back in the day. What's going on? My, my, uh, uh, I'm afraid I'm losing my, uh, my picture here. Hold on. What's going on? Um, yeah, I don't know. You might lose my picture for a second coming up. Um, anyway, uh, there was this publication that went on that was put out back in uh, 1901 or thereabouts from this expedition. And I thought, well, you know, going back to the first part of the turn of the 20th century would be a good way to see how these ruins were before they had been, you know, picked over and destroyed. Because most of the ruins up, there's a lot of really great ruins up there, but Oh, I still haven't transitioned. Gosh, sorry guys. There's a lot of good ruins up there, uh, but they haven't been, they've been picked over. They've all been pot hunted and, and dug up. I went out there uh, when I was there back in July up in uh, the Cholo area. And I talked with a friend who'd been uh, a young man back in say the 70s and 80s and, and um, was in with a lot of the pot hunters. And he said it was just just crazy up there. They were digging up ruins all over the place. They were going out in the middle of the night and digging ruins without permission uh, because they were getting money from selling these pots. And, and it was quite the story that he had to tell. And I thought, wow, you know, um, I, I wish I'd have seen those ruins before that. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of go back and see what, you know, what it was like back in the day. And interestingly, um, this Museum Gates expedition of 1901, you know, was a long time before that. And, uh, and the surprising thing about it is they talk so much about how many of those ruins had been ransacked at that point already and was going on already, people digging up ruins and selling artifacts. So it, it's been going on for over 100 years, uh, surprisingly. Um, so if you give me a second, I want to see if I can make my camera work. I don't know what's going on with it. Just give me one second, guys. Um, I'm having some... I'm having some problems with my... My camera, it just, the camera's working, but I lost the picture uh, where it goes into the computer. So I don't, I don't know what's to blame for that, but I can do it with the little, um, I can do it with the little um, cam that I'm using now, but it's, um, it's not the best way to, it's not the best picture quality. Sorry guys, I don't know what to say, it's just, pooped out on me here. I'm still I'm still trying something. Just give me one second. I would think it was a short, except I didn't touch the wire. I was just sitting down talking, so it's not a short. It, well, it might have something to do with them. The uh, the hardware. Sorry guys, I can't make it work. So I'm just gonna plunge forward. Let's see, what do we got for comments here? Uh, good morning from Airstream Wanderings. Good morning, Ren Pixie. Uh, Wes P, okay, there you are again, hello. Uh, Ren Pixie, Roy, Ray Clark, good day. Have been looking forward to this, good. Marguerite Mesa, hi Marguerite from Durango. Hello Marguerite. Uh, Jeanette Waverly, hi everybody. Uh, okay, um, so I'll show you what I've been doing uh, recently. I, I'm frustrated by the camera, but there's not much I can do about it. Um, 
here's a mug I made in the um, Ancient Potters Club this month. It's a rattle bottom mug, so can you hear it? Um, it it's got little beads in it. It rattles. So this, I'm ready to fire this um, probably, hopefully this weekend I'm going to fire. I'd like to. Uh, and the reason I want to fire this weekend is, let me show you this. There's a big pot I've been working on, and I did a lot of painting on this yesterday. So if I can get the painting finished up today, then hopefully I can fire this tomorrow. And the reason I'm in a hurry is because this has to do with uh, the ancient pottery challenge. This is the Oya and I want to get that finished up and I'm making a video and I'm hoping to in this video do something I've never done before and that is follow the pot from beginning from from starting the uh, the pot forming it all the way through firing so show the whole process in one video so if I can get that fired I'll get that done um, and then uh, the other thing we did in the ancient potters club was um, we made these little I guess these are the mugs they used in um, over on the Mississippi, Mississippian type things. And these would have some um, scraffito, some carved designs in it, uh, but it's still damp, so I'm ready to do that. I might get that done today too. So that's uh, that's what I've been working on. The last couple days have been mostly uh, painting on that Oya and hopefully get that wrapped up soon. I've got the main design in. I just have to um, uh, do the hatching. There's a whole lot of hatching that goes in there. So that's what I've been doing. Oh, the other thing I've been doing, um, uh, mesquite beans. I harvested mesquite beans and I'm cooking those down into um, pottery paint. So another thing I've been working on. Uh, let me open up my my notes here and I can change over to this, which I'm sorry, this um, this camera pooping out on me has thrown me for a loop. So if you can be patient with me. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Here, we are going to turn these off and go back to the beginning, which is here. So, um, this uh, this expedition, they traveled all over um, the little Colorado area. They started up by Sholo in the Forestdale area, and they worked their way north. They went through Sholo. They went, um, <clears throat> they went down by Holbrook, and they end up clear up by Hopi. So, if you can kind of look at a map and draw a line from about... Uh, White River or Sholo up to the Hopi Reservation. They kind of went through that whole area looking at different ruins. Um, and so uh, when they started down in Forestdale, um, these are some of the pots that they found here in Forestdale, these um, these black on white ones. And the top one is some kind of a, maybe a duck effigy. I don't know. It looks like maybe the head or the spout's broken off, but uh, just judging from the, the shape of the body, I would say a duck effigy. And um, they had this to say about that uh, Forestdale, the ruins in the Forestdale area, which is just it's just south of Sholo, just over the rim. The Forestdale pottery is red and gray in color, the red preponderating. Uh, it is found that the paste of both varieties is the same, the redware being secured by covering the gray paste with a slip of yellow ochre burning to red color. The redware is found in forms of bowls, dippers, and small articles. So... Uh, this goes back to what I showed in that video of a couple months back where I was looking for clay up uh, in the White Mountain area 
And I went to some of those ruins and I went to a museum and I showed you some of the pottery and uh, I, we looked inside at the paste, at the, the body clay, and we found that that redware is, is actually um, white. It's formed out of white clay or a light gray colored clay and then slipped with a thin layer of what fires to red. But I remember I said at the time uh, that that's a yellow clay that fires red. And here in 1901, I don't even know how they knew that it was formed with yellow ochre unless they were finding pots that were not fired. But they knew that it was actually slipped with yellow white clay. So they, this was all, you know, this was all known going way back. Uh, this isn't anything new. Uh, interesting. And then uh, let me show you some of the other uh, pots that came from the Forestdale area. So this one is real interesting. This is a double pot. Now, right up in that area, in the Sholo area, in about uh, 1280, somewhere in there, um, there was, if, there was a, a kind of a coming together of different groups. So there was this there was this technology, pottery technology, that the White Mountain Redware technology uh, came down out of um, out of the Zuni area about that time. And that's where it had been made previously. And so it, it, it traveled, I don't know, 150 miles, maybe something, you know, from Zuni down to Sholo. And suddenly it starts being made there in abundance. And um, that's what they call Pinedale polychrome. Uh, at exactly the same moment in time, uh, Salado polychromes were also invented there in that same area. Now, both pottery types are said to have connections to religion. They see religious symbology in the designs on the pottery. So my point has always been, uh, there was some kind of religious revival that went along with these people coming out of the Zuni area. They brought religion in there and, and that, that inspired these new pottery types uh, in that area at that time. Something important happened, um, some kind of a, a, a religious awakening and there were two groups of people then. There were these people that came out of Zuni, bringing their ceramic traditions. And there were the people that had lived there previously, these Mogion with their traditions. And so the two types, Pinedale polychrome, representing the, the Zuni types. Uh, and there was the Salado polychromes, the Pinto polychromes, which represented the, the more Mogion traditions, uh, came out of the Mogion brownware traditions. And and sometimes there, there are a few vessels in existence that show uh, kind of a, a combining of that, kind of half poly, half Pinedale polychrome, half Pinto, trying to show that these two groups were coming together. And this pot here is a great example of that. The left is decorated as Pinedale polychrome, the Zuni tradition. The right is decorated as Salado polychrome, the Mogion tradition. And uh, this also go, shows us that the, the two are fired differently. They've, Salado polychrome is fired differently than uh, White Mountain Redwares as I've always said and shown in my, in my pottery uh, replicating. So in this firing, uh, the Salado polychrome, the organic paint burned out, left you with those gray designs, which is common when you over fire Salado polychrome. So uh, very interesting. And here is what the report had to say about that. Uh, the potter has lavished on this object her highest skill. And the result is an achievement in polychrome wear, which probably marks the highest attainment in ceramic art from the Southwest. We may follow the construction of this vessel with a view of explaining the processes involved. The potter formed two bowls of selected clay and joined them while green by a short neck connecting the rims. She then washed the vessel with fine yellow ochre and finished the surface with a smoothing stone. The interior of one of the bowls was washed with cream colored kaolin and also smoothed with the stone. Having prepared her pigment for the black enamel, the basis of which is iron ore, but the secret of its mixing, whether with alkaline salts or resin, is lost. She skillfully laid on the interior of one of the bowls a geometric design, and on the exterior rims of both various geometric frets, outlining the latter designs with stripes of pure kaolin. The interior of the second bowl required the preparation of a second color, which should burn to a soft gray and melt into the background. The vessel was then fired care being taken to prevent uneven firing and smoke blemishes. The results show a knowledge on the part of the potter of materials, manipulation, and processes. From the selection of the clay to the last stages of firing, and a highly developed artistic sense in form and color that command our respect and admiration. So whoever wrote this report for the Museum Gates expedition obviously thought this was the finest piece of pottery. He, he went into more praise of this piece, this broken double bowl, than, than any other uh, piece of pottery. Uh, from that report that I found. Uh, and it is interesting and it's very important. Uh, a couple things that he's wrong about, uh, all white clay are not kaolin. And so 
archaeologists have since 1901 and clear down to our day wanted to say every time they see white paint, oh, it's kaolin clay. Uh, probably not kaolin, but uh, the other thing that he had wrong was, oh, the enamel paint. So a lot of the White Mountain Redwares are painted with uh, uh, not enamel, but um, um, a glaze, a glaze paint. And so uh, when he's talking about enamel, he's talking about glazes. And the secret to that is uh, not, as he says, which is iron with alkaline salts or resin, but um, lead. Lead is the secret uh, ingredient for that glaze. And I have a video about that you may have seen. Anyways, very interesting pot that came from the um, Forestdale area. What in the world have I done? Hold on. Here we go. Um, still struggling with that darn Sony camera. I don't know. Driving me crazy. I'm sorry. I apologize. What do we got for comments here? Anything? Uh, is the rattle in the handle or the base? Oh, the, the rattle is in the base. Uh, so if you can, I'm sorry, I've got the worst camera now. I actually have a little, can I tip it so you can see? There's actually a little bump in the bottom. Uh, a little a little small, like an upside down bowl, you know, with little beads in it. Uh, and so once it was formed uh, up a little bit, I just took that and pinched it down into the bottom. And there's several little beads of, of clay in the bottom. Why is that still on there? Uh, I'm sorry, this is turning into a train wreck. Uh, so yeah, there's the bead, the, the rattle's in the bottom. And you can see there's, I put a couple holes in the bottom to let it dry evenly uh, in there. So that's that's where the rattle is ray anybody still with me 22 people <laughs> all right so uh here's some more of those designs from uh, the forestdale area and this illustrates what we just talked about uh the bottom one this picture is white mountain redware type that is the type of pottery that would have come out of zuni in the late 1200s uh and the top one is a salado type which is the type that came out of the mogion brownwares that evolved these both types evolved there in that Sholo area in about 1280. So uh, interesting stuff. Uh, and then um, this one is, let's see, what are we at here? Uh, and more of those uh, types of pottery that were found there. This was also from that book. Uh, the link, if you're interested in that book, it's online because it was published in 1901. It's not copyrighted. So you can read the whole book on Google Books. And uh, it's also for sale, reprints are for sale. The links to both of those are in the doobly-doo. Um, so this was interesting about, about the, um, the Forestdale area. And I know there's some sensitivity towards uh, ex digging graves. A lot of the stuff that was done in this, um, this expedition was digging up graves, obviously because the best stuff was there. And all they were really looking for was, um, was you know, artifacts to put in their museum. So... Uh, you know, you might call these, although they were archaeologists, you might find them, call them glorified pot hunters because really all they were wanting was treasures for their museum. These these things all went to the Smithsonian. So they may have been repa repatriated at this point. I don't know a lot of these things that came from graves. Uh, but they had this to say about a grave that they excavated there in the Forestdale area. Um, the similar feelings towards the skillful potter were entertained among the ancients of the Southwest is shown by a series of objects taken from a grave at Four Mile by the Fuchs party in 1897. So this wasn't their expedition. This was the previous one, 1897. Carefully placed in this grave were all the implements of the potter's craft. Concave dishes, uh, a.k.a. pookies, right? Um, uh, where am I at? Lost my place. Concave dishes representing the beginning of the wheel in which the ware was set during manufacture. That's a pookie. Um, smoothing stones. A stone slab. They would use slabs to roll out their coils because they didn't have work surfaces like we have today. Um, stone slab and a mulling stone and grinder, so a little like a, a mortar and pestle. Um, securely laid in a large, well-made cooking vessel on a bed of pine twigs were various kinds of clay and paints. Gourd formers and brushes of yucca strips, if any such were buried, had decayed. So they didn't find gourd scrapers, but they're assuming that perhaps they were there and they just rotted. With these objects were specimens of excellent pottery. The purpose of this disposition seems clearly to furnish this venerated potter the implements with which she might continue her art for the benefit of the spiritual beings in the under heaven. So 
this person was buried with all the tools of a potter. Um, and this shows not only that uh, the potter's art was was looked up to, that this person was uh, somebody important because they made beautiful pottery, but they expected that they were going to be making a beautiful pottery in the afterlife and wanted them to have their tools. So very interesting. Uh, okay, where are we at here? In the uh, Roy, I've had a question for a little bit on these double pots bowls. Were they possibly used for shoulder carry to carry more resources? Uh, Ray Clark. Um, well, that little double bowl that I showed you is, you know, it's it's this big. It, I don't think it could possibly like go over your shoulder. Um, in fact, I don't. I, they're all fairly those double pot that I made and and the ones I've seen. They're all fairly small. I don't think you know, you would carry them on your shoulder. I probably had some ceremonial purpose. Uh, marriage or something, most likely, would be my guess. Uh, so, um, here's some more uh, pictures of some of the pots they found. You've got some plainware there, you got corrugated, and more that uh, black on red that is so famous for coming from the White Mountains. And there's quite a bit of that that they discovered. Uh, there in that expedition, and and these are beautiful pots, and and they're only they're only illustrating the the ones that were whole or or lightly broken. So some really amazing things, and like I said, uh, they did they didn't just dig graves, but they did dig a lot of graves. So a lot of this material could be um, not in the Smithsonian any longer. It could have been repatriated because it came from graves. But all of that that came from rooms uh, that wasn't involved in graves may very well still be at the Smithsonian. Uh, and this redware, uh, that's like he said in the description here, and it's true, it's a, it's a, it's a gray or a white clay. It's got a yellow slip over it that's polished real good, and then uh, it fires to a red. And usually, but not always, that black paint is, um, is glaze or like a, like a subglaze, like it's glazy, but it's not real glaze. And that's uh, done through the use of um, cop, cop, not copper. Um, uh, lead as a flux in their paint and getting high temperatures, obviously. Uh, so this one's interesting. Um, this is uh, another interesting pot, and this one has some little people. Maybe they're hunting. There's some animals in there, and the one on top is just a beautiful geometric form. So um, you don't get you don't get people and animals too much on these, you know, White Mountain pottery. Down in the members' country, that's real common. Even in Hoacom country, uh, it's common to get people and animals, but uh, very rare up here. So real kind of fun, interesting. I like the knobby knees on the guy. There's a there's a famous bowl uh, that came out of the Four Corners area up in Colorado, and there's a little Coco Pelli drawn in the bottom of the bowl, and he's got knobby knees like that. So uh, let me see if we've got another one here. Oh, well, this one's interesting. So, so in the report, there's also uh, illustrations of um, ruin, some of the ruins that they excavated. Um, and this was a ruin uh, that they did some work on and mapped out. That was near. That was near Sholo. At that time, they said it was near Sholo. But I mean, today, obviously, all of these towns have grown. Sholo is covering this ruin. Uh, this ruin is kind of famous because. Uh, they say it's it's completely gone. It's it's under I've heard it's under the you know right about where the McDonald's is in Sholo is where this ruin is. So it's no more. And that's and that goes to the same story I've been telling is not only were a lot of these ruins um, been trashed by pot hunters, um, but they've also been ruined just by development. And, you know, and, and you look at some place like Phoenix as an example. I mean, in the White Mountains, the towns are relatively small, but you look at a place like Phoenix, and there was. There was massive population in the Phoenix area in, you know, uh, prehistoric times. And you don't build a big city on top of all that ruins and, and preserve them. I mean, most of those ruins are under streets and neighborhoods and shopping malls. And um, so it, it's kind of sad when you think about it, that the amount of destruction that's taken place on these ruins. Another beautiful example of some uh, some geometric designs in these bowls, black on white bowls. So um, interesting thing about this report, the the uh, the black on white have black on white photos, obviously, but a lot of the polychromes actually have full color illustrations. Which you know, in 1901, this had to have been a pretty costly publication. They put some effort into making these 
all these illustrations because not a lot of not a lot of publications in 1901 had illustrations at all other than maybe some woodcuts uh, Ray the ones I've seen were large enough for that use and don't know if they would have fit on the shoulder seen were large enough for that use yeah I, I, I don't know Kevin I haven't seen any that big but I mean I'm not saying you're wrong I just the ones I've seen have been you know holding your hand size and I, I have seen a number of them Uh, so this was written in the report. Um, on the day of my arrival in Holbrook, some Mexicans brought in 58 pieces of excellent pottery from ruins 22 miles southwest of that place in McDonald's Canyon. It was ascertained from there, it was ascertained that there were a number of ruins perhaps worthy of examination in the locality whence the specimens came. Hiring a small force of laborers and getting together a camping outfit, on May 1st, we camped by the ruins, 11 miles from nearest water. Though these ruins had been sacked, was able during part of the three days to collect over 100 specimens, many of which had been left as unimportant by the workmen, who only seek the marketable pottery and trinkets. This is 1901. I'm, I'm just dumbfounded by the amount of people uh, who were digging up ruins in 1901 uh it was definitely going on so um here these mexicans brought in 58 pieces to sell in holbrook and they went out spent three days and collected over a hundred specimens so uh these sites were rife with artifacts we walk around on these sites today and we might find a few little tiny little sherds you know the size of a quarter and get excited that is you know that is a mere shadow of what was originally there Unbelievable. So here's um, here's a great example of what you call um, a McDonald corrugated. So it's it's actually a corrugated pot. Uh, it is smudged on the inside. That is, it's fired upside down, so the inside stays uh, carbony, sooty, and black. And then um, it is painted with a white design on it. This is common uh, Mogollon style of pottery in the White Mountain area. So real pretty. And uh, if you saw my video that uh, about John Olson, it shows how they made that corrugated. Real interesting. I haven't made a whole lot of corrugated, but uh, very interesting. In fact, the one that that John made for me in that video, that bowl, he's going to paint on the inside of that. So that'll also be a painted corrugated, but it's different. He won't paint on the outside on the corrugated. He'll paint on the inside. So uh, I'll show you that when I get it. He's gonna. I think he's going to bring it to the kiln conference in September. Uh, and here is a nice, um, this is a Salado polychrome Oya, real nice big one that they found. And you can see that the, um, the paint is a little gray on this. I mean, these, these illustrations are so good that you can, you can even tell the quality of the pottery from them. So that paint looks to me like it's a little gray and that, that organic paint will do that. Sometimes it, it just, you fire it a little too much or something and it just kind of, it's a little bit see-through-y, you know, it's not quite as black as you'd like. I have, I've fired many pieces of Salado polychrome replicas that have the same kind of effect where they're just a little bit shadowy. So um, it's sometimes interesting to, when the ancient people get the same effects, right? And you know you're doing something right. Um, uh, let's see, where am I at on this thing? So they found this other ruin. They went to another place. Um, they're, they're exploring around the Holbrook area, and they're going out to these ruins, and they're going out to these ruins, and ranchers are telling them, oh, there's ruins over here. So they found some ruins that were that were nobody had been to before. Um, in the neighborhood of these ruins shows few evidences of erosion. Hence, the Pueblos have been little disturbed and appear as low, weed-grown mounds strewn with fragments of pottery, house stones, and other debris. The location of the group was known by two or three cattlemen only who had ridden over the site, and to this fact is due the preservation of the remains from the vandals who have ransacked the ancient pueblos of the southwest for a number of years without let or hindrance. Um, so uh, they found some ruins. This is I got to say it again. This is 1901. They found ruins that had been undisturbed, and they were surprised by the condition of them because so many of the ruins in the area had been, in their words, ransacked. So, uh, again, th the amount of disturbance to these ruins that was going on in 1901 is astounding. Um, 
so let's uh, let's go to the next picture. I think we're going to start getting into Hopi pottery pretty quick. Oh, this is an interesting one. So there in the White Mountain area, uh, there is a tradition where uh, they would make these pitchers, and the handles would be little animals, little, I don't know, dogs or deer. I don't know what they're supposed to be. but So these are two examples of uh, the animal handles that they found in this expedition. So the top one is redware, the bottom one is whiteware. Um, and those red and whiteware traditions are kind of like neck and neck, right? Uh, for many years, so they would um, they would have um, uh, they were making whiteware, they're making redware at the same time, and you'd see the same designs on both, you know. So like they'd start making a, a new type of design, suddenly it appear on the redware as well. So they were kind of like sister pottery styles, made very similarly, um, in that they may both have um, um, uh, that. They said enamel, now it's got that in my head, uh, that glaze paint. Uh, they're both made with that same gray or light colored uh, body clay that's formed out of. Um, the main difference is they're slipped differently um, and then they're fired differently, of course. The one has to be in an oxidizing fire and the other in a reduced fire to get it nice and white. So um, let me move on to the, I think we're going to get into the Hopi pottery next. And uh, so here's some really great examples of the Hopi yellowware with some some symbology there. The, the top one looks like hands. I'm not even the bottom one. That might be a turkey tail. I don't. I mean, you could spend a lot of time trying to you know figure those out. They, they I think they're definitely trying to tell a story. Um, so it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. And like I said, most of the pottery that they show in this book is whole. So this one on the bottom is broken. Uh, this tells us that you know. <laughs> they liked this one a lot that they actually showed it broken because they were obviously avoiding broken pottery here. Um, here, going on with the report, um, he says, for a number of years, pottery has been coming into Holbrook from the north. And for the best of reasons, the persons collecting pottery for gain were indefinite as to location until the spoils had been gathered. The specimens brought in were usually mixed as to quality and color of wares due to careless methods of collection. The presence of fine yellow pottery of Hopi type in these mixed lots of gray, red, etc. So uh, here in Holbrook, there were people that were buying the pottery. And then there was these, you know, people that were going out and digging the ruins and not wanting to tell people where their ruins were because they didn't want to be, you know, told to leave or, or, um, or they didn't want anybody else going out and digging their ruins. And they're bringing in Hopi pottery and they're bringing in red ware and gray ware. And, and these are some of the types of pottery that they were bringing in. Uh, yeah, just shocking to me, 1901, that this stuff was going on. Uh, and so here these archaeologists are out here and they're, they're literally trying to beat the scumbags to the artifacts. They want them for their museum before they're, they're gone. Uh, and so uh, very interesting and, and trying to find out where these ruins are because the guys that were digging it didn't want them to know where these ruins were. Uh, and so uh, they were having to try to get the information or go out and hunt down these ruins just with vague descriptions of where they were over there. They're over in those hills, you know. So very interesting. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this Hopi pottery in a second. Let me see what we've got for um, uh, comments here. Uh, hello from Brazil, Pedro. Hi, Pedro. Um, in the rat, oh, the rat, I read that. Okay. Uh, question for, no, got that one. The question about the, um, we're not autocorrect. Oh yeah, Kevin's autocorrect. So yeah, there were, what Kevin is saying is those, those bilobal, not bilobal, those, those double jars and double bowls, uh, they're not big enough that he's ever seen to go over his shoulder. So they're, they're quite small. So, uh, and Wes says, uh, does the last one have red slip on the outside and then painted with white? Oh gosh, uh, Wes, which one was that? Most of these redwares that I've shown, these white mountain redwares, they're not formed with red clay. They, I don't think I've ever seen one formed with red clay. Occasionally, very rarely, you will find one that's formed with brown clay. Um, but they're always slipped with that yellow, that yellow ochre clay that you get up in the White Mountains. And I have some of that. And so, um, even though they look red, uh, you know, red wear does not mean formed with red clay. Red wear just means uh, it's red in appearance. It's red on the outside. And that's because it has a slip, something that fires, you know, that oxidizes red in the firing. So most of those White Mountain redwares are actually formed with a gray or a white clay, something local to the White Mountains. So they're really good clays up there uh, are yet generally in the gray range. So uh, that's what they are. Now, 
about these Hopi wares. Uh, these are formed of the gray clay as well, uh, but it has enough iron in it that in their firing, it will turn yellow. Now, I've been up there um, in Antelope Mesa. They say most of this yellow ware back in the 12, 1300s was coming out of Antelope Mesa. And, and there on Antelope Mesa, uh, that's kind of south and east of where the Hopi live today. There's no Hopi Pueblos on Antelope Mesa today. Uh, but there was back in, you know, in ancient times. And so at one time, that's where a lot of the yellow ware was being made. And right there, there's a whole string of, um, of ruins along the, the uh, kind of eastern flank of Antelope Mesa. And, um, and right there along that edge of the Mesa, there was everything they needed to make this stuff. There was the gray clay that fires yellow. Uh, there was the little nodules of, um, of manganese and, and iron ore that they used for the red and the black and the yellow and the orange, they had different colors that they used on this. But all of that material for the pigments that they used for the paint are right there found in the same areas, right along that edge of Antelope Mesa. Uh, and then the final ingredient is this, these, this pottery was all coal fired. And so it's really hard. And that's one of the things that made it uh, in demand in the ancient Southwest was because it was hard. It was durable. They would trade it far and wide. Uh, it could handle being traded far and wide. It, you know, you throw it in a pack and walk a hundred miles. And some of your pottery breaks, right? But this coal fired pottery is really hard. Uh, and then the coal firing gave it a nice bright yellow color. So uh, the neat thing about that as a pottery, I think there was five, six large villages along the edge of Antelope Mesa. And these places were just churning out this yellowware pottery and, and trading it off. And they were able to do that, not partially because all the materials were at hand. You can literally just walk out from the village a hundred yards and collect everything you need. The pigments, the clay, the fuel for firing, everything's right there. How fast can you make pottery if you don't have to travel very far to get the materials or depend on traders to bring it in, right? So uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, and I went out there with Bobby Silas in um, uh, 2019, excuse me. And, um, and we explored along the edge. We collected a bucket of clay. We looked at the sherds in the ruins. Um, uh, we looked at the, the coal layers and Bobby actually collected coal and brought it back. Bobby fires with, um, he's a, a Hopi potter. He brought some coal back. He actually fires with that coal and makes Sidyatki polychrome replicas. So fascinating, fascinating area. Uh, and a really important pottery producing center back in, uh, you know, 1300. Now, uh, Bobby and I are going to make a video or we have plans to make a video at the end of uh, the 1st of September, the end of August. So here in another month, I'm going to go up there again to Antelope Mesa and Bobby and I are going to make a video about this and we're going to we're going to visit these coal seams, we're going to visit the the clay uh areas where these where people were excavating that that clay that fires yellow. We're going to look at the ruins and Bobby's going to make some of this pottery. So uh that's I'm really excited about that. That's a great opportunity for me uh, making a video. I'm really excited about making that video with Bobby cuz he's an excellent excellent potter. He does really fine work. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, Kevin says, we have to remember up until 1930s and even into the 40s, much of Arizona was really still living in the 1800s. Transportation-wise, with highways only complete post-World War II in Northeast Arizona. Oh, yeah. I, I totally get that, Kevin. Uh, where I lived in, um, I grew up in Cochise County, and it was a lot of the same. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, Phoenix or Tucson. And so it was slower to get paved roads and such. Uh, would the coal Bobby uses be? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure what you're saying there, Ren Pixie. Long, longing or bituminous? I don't know a lot about it, but he calls it lignite. Are you trying to say lignite and it's, and it's autocorrecting you maybe? It's coming out as longing. But lignite is the coal that Bobby uh, is collecting there in Antelope Mesa. I don't, I don't know much about coal, so you might know more about it than I do. Okay, let me move to the next uh, picture here. <laughs> lignite. I know what you're trying to say, Ren Pixie. It's, I think you're trying to say lignite, and that's, that's what they're using. 
Uh, so here's um here's a beautiful picture of a of a Hopi yellowware parrot um, that they found up in the Hopi area. Just amazing. And I've seen several of these. Uh, I've seen ones that are polychrome too. This one just looks like um, uh, what do they call it? Jedido black on yellow. Uh, but there are polychrome examples as well. And uh, so this is a really beautiful piece. Uh, and I like the way the design on the side. It, it even uh, the way those those long kind of triangles almost represent feathers, wing feathers. Amazing. This would be quite the pot to um, to reproduce. Okay, let's uh, let's move along and see what we got here. Oh, and here's some Sidyaki polychrome. So this is this is really the good stuff. You've got like a a reddish colored uh, uh, pigment. You've got black. Uh, it seems like there's even like a, a lighter color, orange colored pigment they're using. Sometimes you'll find white in these as well. So really amazing stuff. And they'll do uh, stippling. So I think that one on the top um, has stippling in it. And that's another thing that's common in those Hopi wares of the time um, that came from, I don't know, wanting to add a, another texture to it. And they would use, I don't know, like a brush or something and just flick little splatters of paint. Um, and so going back to the report, uh, it says, one of the most depressing features connected with the work of the Pueblo region is the evidence of vandalism and unskilled exploration encountered on almost all of the prehistoric sites. The extent of this devastation can scarcely be realized. No ruin is so obscure or inaccessible that some sheep herder or prospector has not put in some of his tedious hours digging in it. Soon it was found that relics from these pueblos had commercial value. With this entering wedge, the collecting of relics became a business, and men traversed the region for the sole purpose of tearing up the ruins for their private gain. Almost every trader either employed Indians to dig or bought all the specimens that Indians brought in at a nominal price, and many were the men who had collections for sale. To give an idea of the extent of this vandalism, an unscientific collection, it may be said that from one town alone, during the past 10 years, about 20,000 specimens have been shipped. From other neighboring towns, about 7,000 specimens. From the same points during this period, about 10,000 specimens have been shipped by scientific exploring parties. The speculative collective collecting was from Indian reservations, railroad, and government lands. So they're saying that... Um, vast amounts of, of pottery, about twice as much to private collectors as we're going to museums, which, um, like I said, if, if we can't access those museums, they might as well be in private collections, right? I mean, a lot of these are in museums back east. They're, they're not really available to people that are studying this pottery out here today, are they? Uh, because, like, I'm going to travel to Boston to, to view these relics? No, you know, I'm Washington, D.C. is a long way. So, um, it'd be nice if those were available here in Arizona for people that wanted to study, right? Um, but even without that, here's 30,000 just from one place, relics that are just torn out of these ruins. And even those archaeological expeditions at that time, they weren't really doing a lot of science. The, the, the reports they published, the records they kept are pretty minimal by today's standard uh, for what is collected at an archaeological dig. At any rate, uh, it's surprising to me because I always thought if I went back to 1900, I would find pristine ruins and I would be able to see. I mean, I, obviously, I'm not going to travel back to 1900. But in my mind, I always thought, boy, if I could go back 100 years, you know, and these ruins were untouched. And it's just not so. You'd have to go back 150 years, you know. Well, the, the Apaches were still uh, a danger in the region <laughs> to, in order to find ruins that were maybe uh, more pristine, and you know wouldn't want to do that. So uh, very interesting to me was the amount of disturbance that this report brings out happening in those days. Uh, was the coal-fired pottery considered stoneware temperatures? Uh, I, I, yes, I believe it was, although I, I'm not an expert on, you know, what is constituted stoneware, um, but it, it is very hot. Not only does the coal burn hotter than wood, it burns longer. So when Bobby does these firings, he'll, he'll stack the coal He'll stack the coal up around the pottery, make a little oven out of it, and then he lights it. And then he goes away, and he doesn't come back till the next morning, and it sits there all night and cooks. 
Uh, and so it's, it's a long soak of very high temperatures. So I believe so. It is very, very hard and clinky, if you know what I mean. Strawberry Hellcat, welcome to Plainware Pottery. Thanks, thanks for joining Strawberry Hellcat. I appreciate that very much. I appreciate the support. Uh, do I have any more pictures here? No, I'm at the end of pictures, but I still have more, a couple more things to share from the report. Uh, if we have any questions about pottery, uh, go ahead and ask those so I can get to those because we've only got about 15 minutes left, okay? Okay, so this is his, uh, his kind of summing up his, uh, this expedition uh, in 1901. During the season, uh, over 55 ruins were visited and 18 of these were excavated in a region nearly 200 miles north and south by 70 miles east to west. Some idea of the difficulties encountered, aside from 800 miles of wagon travel, may be gathered when it is known that five of the groups required dry camps, water being hauled considerable distances. The work, however, was quite successful. 2,500 specimens having been collected, these are artifacts, of course, in connection with this work, ethnological photographs, data, and specimens were secured from the Apache, Navajo, and Hopi Indians. So, um, 55 ruins, and believe me, they were probably digging at all those ruins. Um, 18 were excavated. In a re oh, eight, okay, 55 were visited. 18 were excavated, okay? And then it's a huge area, 200 miles north and south by 70 miles east and west. So, uh, they covered some country. They dug up some artifacts. 2,500 artifacts? Wow. And this stuff was all probably crated up and shipped back to the Smithsonian. So, super uh, fascinating. And this book, I, the, the pictures I've shared with you here, is just the tip of the iceberg. There are lots and lots of pictures. Pictures of ruins. Um, pictures of lots and lots of these colored illustrations of pottery. Um, fo black and white photographs of pottery. And, and other things. Uh, axe heads. Uh, pipes. Um, shell jewelry. Um, uh sketches of, of ruins, uh, you know, like floor plans of ruins, uh, uh, maps. It's, it's really, really amazing. I wish I had the paper version. I might just try to order it off Amazon uh, because it's got a lot of um, really um, fascinating information from a time period that, you know, when we go out today, like I said, I wish I could go back. So I, sometimes I go there and I think, man, what was this ruin? You know, a lot of these ruins you go to and they're just they're just piles where people have just dug and dug and dug, or or some of these have been pushed off with a with a you know a bulldozer, just destroyed. And you think, man, if I could go back to 1900, yeah. And this is a little glimpse, even though there was destruction going on at that time. This is a glimpse at what they were like before they were destroyed, or just at the time they were starting to. So. To me, a real interesting report. And from a potter's point of view, there's a lot of good information here about the pottery. I was surprised how much he knew about uh, the yellow slip was used to make the redware, um, about uh, a lot of these things. So, uh, interesting reading. Uh, one little bonus bit that I found interesting. Now, I don't know if you've seen my video about pookies. This is what you call a pookie. Uh, it, uh, this is a perforated plate, sorry. This is a pookie is a, is a base mold for your round bottom pot. Uh, but the perforated plates are found uh, all over Arizona and even down into southern Arizona. And they have little holes. On you can see the holes around the outside. Uh, this is one I made. This is not an artifact. Um, and they don't know what the holes were for. Um, but they were used a lot in, in prehistoric times to make pottery. And, um, and I found them in the field. Uh, sherds, sherds of them out at ruins where they were making pottery. So always fun to find it when you find a sh perforated plate sherd because... Uh, it's not just a sherd, it's a pottery making tool. So I feel a connection, right, to the to the potter, the ancient potter, who is, of course, my muse. Um, so here, another little tip from this, um, of what they knew back when they did this Museum Gates expedition of 1901. They knew, even then, I've read a report in like 2000 about perforated plates and, you know, oh, we speculate that these were used as pookies, you know, and I thought that was new. But they knew that back in 1901. Look, this is what written in the report. The concave disks of pottery with holes punched around the edge are almost lacking at this one village. I can't pronounce it. It's a Hopi name. They're almost lacking there. It is conjectured that these objects may have been used as revolving rests for wear during the process of manufacture, as are the 
tabipi, or bottom forms employed by the potters of Hano at present. Hano is a, a Hopi village. A portion of this customary imperforated disc with clay still attached to the concave surface was found at this ruin. So they found one at a ruin that still had wet clay on the inside. Well, it wasn't wet, but you know, unfired clay on the inside. And so even back in 1901, uh, they were able to deduce that these were, in fact, perforated plates were actually used for pukis. So and to me, that was, that was surprising that they figured that out so early. So the information they had about potters is um, really uh, impressive that, I, that they were able to figure out so much. And, uh, and it's really educational, very fascinating report. I hope you get a chance to look at it. Like I said, um, it is available online on Google Google Books for um, for online viewing for free, and I I downloaded a copy, a PDF copy of it. That's how I got these um these images I shared with you. And there's a lot more. This, like I said, these images are just tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of good stuff. So uh, that's that's everything I had today, guys. Uh, do you, do we have questions? Because I didn't get almost any good questions to I mean I'm not I'm not saying your questions aren't good I'm saying there weren't very many you know so if you have um questions we have um you know eight or nine more minutes or I can wrap this up early guys um uh, I really appreciate y'all showing up today and I my camera I don't know I don't know what's going on I it won't When things like this happen, it throws me for a loop, and then, you know, I'm anxious about appearing live on the video as it is, and then these things happen, and it really makes me, throws me for a loop, and then I do even worse, so, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. You guys, come on, give me some questions, people. I don't have anything to say. Rattle bottom mug. Hopefully, I'll be able to fire tomorrow, or... Yeah, tomorrow, Saturday. I'll get that pot finished. I've got a lot of hatching to do today. The hatching of the little, you know, the little parallel lines. Whew, let me show you. Let me show you. If I can if I can show you the ha what hatching looks like. Uh, I thought I had some hatching on here. Maybe I don't. Anyway, can't help you there. I can't find any hatching. Now you have seen or heard of similar expeditions over toward the state line more. I'm over in Nutrioso, so always curious about. Yeah, I, you know, he talked about in this report, he said uh, that they needed to do more research in that area south of Zuni. So, you know, like where you're at there. They said that area south of Zuni is rich and, and needs more research done. So at, I get the impression from what he wrote that at that time, there had been very little research done in that area. Um, not sure, you know, I'm sure there's, I know there's research in that area. I just, I'm not sure what report, but I'll tell you what, um, uh, is it you, is it Kevin? Yeah, I'll tell you what, Kevin, I will, um, I will look, I will look into that and see if I can find something from over there because uh, those old reports are fascinating. What is the minimum temperature for firing? Oh, uh, Wes. Uh, Wes wants to know what the minimum temperature for firing is. I can usually, and it, and it varies because each clay is different, right? And it has to do with the fluxes that are naturally in clay. So a lot of the brown wares and red wares that we find in southern Arizona will mature, that is, form ceramic at a lower temperature than the white or gray wares that we get in northern Arizona because they don't have those natural fluxes. That being said... Some of those white and gray wares are much more usable than those brown wares from southern Arizona, but that's beside the point. So I, a lot of my brown wares, I can get away with, I can get away with 650, 700 degrees Celsius a lot of times. Now I usually shoot for 750, knowing that if I get to 750, I'm going to have a good solid pot. Uh, but but sometimes if you're just barely at seven, you can still be okay. Um, you know. There's always, when I first started out, I was low firing a lot of stuff uh, and I didn't realize it, right? I'd take it out and I'd be like, oh, look at my pot. It's so beautiful. And then I, uh, at one point I had all these boxes of old pottery that I'd made that was just really junk from when I was learning. And so I decorated my yard with them and I stuck them down along the flower beds and I lined the walk with them. And I learned something very interesting about that over the course of a year or two, as the rains came down, these pottery, some of them began to 
fall apart and uh, disintegrate. And so a lot of that pottery was not fired hot enough. Um, you know, but I wasn't measuring temperature at that time, so I couldn't tell you what I was what I was firing to. I just thought I, you know, I was good enough, and I wasn't. So, I would say I would say seven hundred as a bare minimum. But I think you might be able to get away with six fifty, depending on the clay body. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Lament Le Dave says thanks for the answers. It was really informative. I'm glad to help. I uh, appreciate that comment. What is your theory for the preparation? <laughs> I have none. I think, and I've heard a lot. I've heard uh, they were they were stitching in piece of cloth, which makes it release easier. Uh, that the holes let in air that helps it dry better. Um, I've heard uh, that it that they're used for design purposes, like laying out designs. I've heard all kinds of things. I don't buy any of them. I think uh, it it had something to do with um, their spiritual beliefs or their traditions, right? So. Uh, you know, people in those days, I don't want to use the word primitive because it can be derogatory. I don't mean it that way, but my relatives too, you go back a few hundred years, right? Um, not just Native Americans, Europeans, Africans, anybody that's living in a world where there's not a lot of science, they tend to believe a lot of superstitions, you know, and, and uh, they have, you know, some, they had some they had some belief about it, right? Like maybe, um, you know, by putting the holes in it, it makes, you know, there was a lot of superstitions regarding uh, pottery making. Like you couldn't make pottery if you were menstruating or uh, you couldn't make loud noises around somebody that was making pottery because those loud noises would go into the pottery and then in the firing, it would break and those loud noises would come out. You know, there's a lot of things about that. I think it had something to do with that. Not, not that specifically, but some kind of belief that wasn't based in any reality. That's my theory, but we'll never know. I mean, I don't think there's anything you can prove that it does anything because I've used these and I've used ones without and I don't, I don't see any advantage whatsoever in the way I make pottery. So I, it's just speculation and it's fun to speculate, but I think it's some kind of belief that wasn't based in science or anything, you know, but that's just my theory. Uh, are there any sites for lignite harvesting that are accessible? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, is that Ren Pixie? Uh, yeah, up in the White Mountains where I collected clay um, up by the clay mine, that is actually called Coal Canyon or Coal Mine Canyon, something like that. There's coal up there. Um, I went a couple miles over farther west uh, to a place called Bear Spring, which is real close to the rim. Uh, it's on the Sit Graves National Forest. And um, I looked at the aerial photography, and I could see the kind of bullseyes on the landscape, right? Like like black lines, circles, right? And I thought, what is that? So I went out there, and there were layers of white, like sandstone, and then there were layers of clay. And there were these little, hi not clay, uh, coal, layers of coal. And so there were these little hills. And so the layer of coal was in the middle of the hill. So when you look down on it from Google Earth, it made a black circle and that was coal. And there's coal up there, yeah. And um, Bobby, Bobby lives at, Z Bobby's a Hopi potter, but he lives at Zuni, right? And he collects coal over by Gallup. So um, yeah, there's, there's lignite that you can harvest different places. I don't, I don't know of any that I could say, oh yeah, I'd go up there, just drive your truck up and fill it up. I don't, I don't know any place like that, but I, I, I'm sure there are. You got to go out and explore, just like finding clay or pigment. You got to get out there and hit those back roads. Uh, do you know of a process to remove sand from yellow ochre? Oh yeah, Liz H. Uh, it's called levigation. And it's like, if you look at my, if you look at my video, my YouTube videos go all the way back to like the first one. I think it's the very first one or maybe the second. And it's like uh, how to process clay. And it's my presentation from the Southwest Kiln Conference in 2014, I think. And you just settle it in water and you let the, you mix it all up and you let the sand settle for a minute. And then you pour off that clear clay in the middle uh, at the top or the yellow ochre. So the yellow ochre is fine, fine particles, but the sand are heavier particles and they will settle. And then you've got it sitting in water and you have to let it like evaporate. So uh, levigation is what you want. If you go back to that first or second video I ever made, you will see that process. Uh, Roy, Ray says, what effect does the grog coarseness have? What effect does the grog coarseness have on what? On the pottery? Um, it helps it dry more evenly. So if it doesn't have grog in it, your clay is going to dry 
a lot and shrink on the outside. It's going to stay wet and expanded on the inside. It's going to cause breakage. So what you want is you want the pot to dry evenly. And adding grog opens it up so that that moisture can move out of it uh, efficiently. Uh, is 800 harder than 700? Hmm. So Wes, you're saying firing, like, is the pottery harder if it's fired at 800? I think it's always true that the hard, the hotter you get your pottery, the harder it's going to fire. Um, so 800 is hard. Pottery fired to 800 degrees Celsius is harder than pottery fired to 700 degrees Celsius. I would think, although I don't, you know, I don't have science behind me, but that's my theory. That's my, that's what I believe. Um, 800 is also harder to reach than 700. So it's hard in different ways. Pedro, I need to test my backyard pit firing pots. Ah, uh, test my backyard pit firing pots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Throw them out in the rain. Just let them sit there, Pedro, and, and you will find out if they're fired hard enough or not. That's the ultimate test of pottery, uh, you know, primitive pottery, especially when you um, you want to know if it's fired hard enough or, or just put it in your kitchen sink and fill it with water and let it sit there for a day and see if it survives. Water is the ultimate uh, arbiter. Let's see. Uh, Liz says, thanks. Ray says, awesome, thank you. Chris in Kansas, there you are. Dang, I'm in the mall and I'm low battery later. <laughs> Chris, you're late. You're late to the party. All right, everybody, um, I'm at 11 o'clock. Um, I appreciate all your questions. I'm sorry for the for the video problem. I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to buy some hardware today uh, uh, because I'm, I'm thinking the problem is, is that the little dongle that connects my phone to the computer is crapped out on me, so... I appreciate you guys coming along. Uh, I, I really do. And all your great questions. Uh, have a great one. I haven't. All right. Goodbye, everybody.